McKinsey was advising both the Fox and the Hen House and getting paid by both. McKinsey also advises the U.S. government, including hundreds of millions of dollars worth of work for the Pentagon, according to an NBC News investigation. Have you ever heard of a company called McKinsey & Co? They're the oldest and largest of the big three management consulting firms, and they work with virtually every company you can think of. This includes everyone from American Express and AT&T to Citibank and General Motors. McKinsey also offers some of the best salaries for college graduates and offers them an exciting opportunity to travel the world and work with the largest companies. But behind the hood, McKinsey isn't all that it's hyped up to be. For one, their business is management consulting, which isn't all that effective or useful. If you're wondering why companies hired them despite that, check out our video on that. But being ineffective isn't the only critique of McKinsey. If anything, it's actually the smallest critique. The biggest red flag is that they've been involved in the biggest scandals of all time, from Enron and the 2008 financial crisis to the opioid epidemic and election scandals. And those are just to name a few. McKinsey has also played a role in most of the scandals and evil businesses that Jake Tran has covered, even including the ones about authoritarian regimes like Saudi Arabia and Russia. Ironically, it seems like they're much more effective at helping shady nefarious projects than they are when it comes to doing actual positive management consulting. But despite their large negative influence, they're rarely talked about on the news or social media. The fact that they're completely privately owned just makes them even more discreet and secretive. But McKinsey & Co. wasn't always so shady. Like most companies, McKinsey was established with good intentions, and for many decades, they had a relatively clean record. So here's the story of how McKinsey & Co. became the consultants that deserve hell. Taking a look back, the story of McKinsey dates all the way back to 1926 to a man named James O. McKinsey. James was an accounting professor at the University of Chicago, and he got the idea to create McKinsey & Co. after witnessing a bunch of inefficiencies across military suppliers. Given that he was an accounting professor, he felt that he could clean up their books and make these suppliers a lot more efficient. So he went ahead and established an accounting and management firm called James O. McKinsey & Company. While the firm carries James' name to this day, James actually didn't play a very big role in its growth or expansion, largely because he couldn't. You see, about 10 years after founding the company, James would be hit with a severe case of pneumonia that took his life. But on the bright side, it looks like James had already hired a star partner named Marvin Bauer who could carry on his legacy. By trade, Bauer was actually a lawyer, but he never really worked as a lawyer given that he joined McKinsey a few years after graduating and he basically became the father of the company. Bauer established much of McKinsey's corporate culture and created policies that are now used around the world like the up or out policy. As the name suggests, if you don't get promoted within a certain time frame, you get fired. This ensures that no employee is stagnating or getting too comfortable. But this policy has come under fire during recent times as it also encourages backstabbing and corporate politics. But anyway, McKinsey would drift away from its accounting roots not long after James's death. In fact, the company would physically split up into three different companies in 1939 called Scowell Wellington & Company, McKinsey & Company, and McKinsey Kearney & Company. The accounting practice would be shifted to Scovell, which left the other companies with the classic management consulting. While this division robbed McKinsey of much of its subject matter expertise, McKinsey retained much of the military supply relationships that James had established. And this was extraordinarily valuable given that World War II and the Cold War were just around the corner. McKinsey became the go-to consultants for governments, defense contractors, and military organizations around the world, which allowed for exponential growth throughout the 40s and 50s. They went from 88 consultants in 1951 to over 200 consultants by the 1960s. They were also able to establish a massive base of operations in Europe, with offices in London, Paris, and Amsterdam. Despite all this growth, Bauer never forgot about his employees. 
In fact, he would constantly work to make sure his employees were well taken care of. For example, in 1951, he established a profit sharing program, and in 1956, he would shift 100% of the company's ownership to the firm's employees. And that's how it is to this day. But while things were developing great within McKinsey, the same could not be said about the industry and business as a whole. As the era of the Red Scare came to an end in the late 1960s, so did the era of the original McKinsey & Co. While McKinsey was highly sought after in the early days due to their services being novel and unique, the same could not be said by the 1970s. You see, after McKinsey ditched their accounting roots, they never focused on another technical discipline. And while this worked out early on, as the industry matured, McKinsey's services became less and less valuable. Most companies preferred to hire technical consultants with strong backgrounds in engineering, information technology, and enterprise resource planning as opposed to generalists. This is why technical consulting firms like Accenture and TCS have far outperformed their legacy consultants in recent decades. New competition in management consulting from firms like Boston Consulting Group and Bain & Company didn't help the situation either. In fact, in 1971, McKinsey's own internal commission found that McKinsey had become too focused on geographic expansion and lacked adequate industry knowledge. The commission advised that McKinsey slow its growth and develop industry specialties. Ideally, McKinsey would have specialized in the rapidly growing tech industry, but instead, they decided to specialize in various management consulting niches. This included sectors such as strategy, operations, and organization. While these sectors better defined what McKinsey was offering, it didn't exactly change what they were offering, so they continued to face many of the same issues. You could say that McKinsey had trouble pitching their value proposition to companies, but they would eventually figure it out after they analyzed what company leaders truly wanted. Company leaders didn't necessarily want strategy or branding consulting. What they really wanted was growth, happy shareholders, a good reputation, and less responsibility. McKinsey couldn't guarantee growth or happy shareholders, but they could help leaders achieve a good reputation and less responsibility by becoming scapegoats. Are you the leader of a Fortune 500 company that needs to make a bunch of hard choices? Well, hire us and we'll probably tell you to make the same choices, but we can make it a win-win scenario for you. If the choices end up working well, you can take the praise and glory. If they don't work, on the other hand, you can blame us and walk away relatively clean. For many legacy leaders, this is a deal that's too good to turn down, and in modern times, this is very much the real appeal of management consultants. While this turned out to be quite lucrative and in demand, McKinsey had regressed from being accounting experts to becoming generalists to becoming scapegoats. But this was just the beginning of their devolution. Remember how we talked about company leaders having to make hard choices? Well, these hard choices didn't just include completing layoffs or shutting down an underperforming sector. Many of these choices related to truly nefarious activities. Before you knew it, McKinsey was knees deep in shady activities and evil projects like Enron. If you're not familiar with Enron, it was the largest accounting fraud of all time leading to shareholder losses of $74 billion. The first thing we should note is that the mastermind of the scandal, Jeff Skilling, was formerly a McKinsey consultant for 21 years. But that's just the beginning of McKinsey's connection to Enron. Enron would use McKinsey on 20 different projects, and the two companies were so close that McKinsey consultants had, quote, used Enron as their sandbox. McKinsey would never be convicted for their connection to Enron, and while you can write off Enron as a one-off connection, McKinsey has so many such connections that it's hard to write off everything as just a coincidence, which brings us into our next exhibit, which is the 2008 financial crisis. McKinsey is iconic for encouraging banks to securitize mortgage assets and fund their balance sheets using debt. These practices are what would eventually make the global financial system insolvent, leading to the crisis. During this time period, McKinsey also advised financial institutions to deliberately screw over end users. For example, they advised Allstate Insurance to purposely give low offers to claimants. The idea was that fighting this injustice would be so expensive that lawyers would refuse to help these clients. Moving on, we have likely their most disgusting scandal, as it didn't just screw over people's finances. 
It literally screwed over their lives as their next scandal relates to the opioid epidemic. McKinsey created a strategy for pharmaceuticals that would quote-unquote turbocharge sales of OxyContin. This essentially consisted of McKinsey advising pharmaceutical companies how they could actively circumvent opioid regulations and deliberately encourage and get people addicted. For victims of addiction, it's common for their close family, if they have any, to try to talk to them and persuade them from an emotional standpoint. If you've ever been in this situation and you've had trouble getting to the victim, well, you can blame McKinsey because they were literally proposing strategies to counter the emotional messages from mothers with teenagers who overdosed on OxyContin. They were also proposing that pharmaceutical companies pay pharmacies a rebate based on how many overdoses and addictions they caused. I mean, they literally had it down to a science. In 2019, they projected that 2,400 CVS customers would become addicted, and that each event, which is what they called it, deserved a rebate of $14,810. This meant that Purdue Pharma would have to pay CVS $36.8 million that year for their work. Fortunately, these scumbags got exposed, but they would walk away with a settlement of just $573 million, which is ridiculous because this is not the type of crime that you get fined for. It's the type of crime that you get shut down for. Yet, here we are. At least with this one, McKinsey wasn't directly causing debts. With these next few cases, well, you can be the judge. McKinsey and Saudi Arabia are basically best friends, given that McKinsey has completed 600 projects for Saudi Arabia between 2011 and 2016 alone. Saudi Arabia is an authoritarian regime that doesn't like its citizens dissenting with its leaders. So, naturally, many of McKinsey's projects have to do with silencing dissenters. Now, let me be clear, McKinsey only identifies such individuals, they're not involved in what happens next. But when you know that there's a good chance that the people that you identify will be unfairly arrested, if not offed, it's quite immoral that you continue consulting with said government. Saudi Arabia isn't their only authoritarian client either. Another authoritarian client is of course, China. A great example of their indifferent and soulless behavior is their actions during the peak of the Uyghur genocide in China. Back in December of 2018, McKinsey hosted a lavish company retreat alongside Chinese officials while thousands of Uyghurs were being detained and offed just miles away. McKinsey received quite a bit of backlash for this behavior, but it doesn't look like they've changed their ways. You know how virtually every Western corporation has withdrawn from Russia due to the war? Well, it looks like McKinsey didn't get the memo as it's reported that McKinsey has been offering consulting services to the Russian state-owned enterprise Rostock, who is responsible for manufacturing missile engines in the Ukraine war. What makes this even more unethical is that McKinsey was consulting with the Pentagon at the same time. McKinsey also has a history of scandals with democratic countries. For example, it's alleged that McKinsey helped the Gupta family to position corrupted individuals across the South African government. Similarly, it's also alleged that McKinsey helped French President Emmanuel Macron to bypass campaign finance laws. And finally, it's also alleged that McKinsey has been helping Canada implement immigration policies that don't have the public's best interest in mind. Hearing all this, I don't think I need to explain the title. While McKinsey started off with good intentions of improving corporate accounting and management efficiency, they slowly saw their value proposition decline decade after decade. Instead of pivoting to the technical space which was the up-and-coming consulting industry, they decided to turn to the dark side. They became corporate scapegoats and secret advisors on nefarious strategies. These include everything from financial fraud and corporate scandals to ruining countless lives and causing debts. Yet, given that McKinsey is just a consulting firm and doesn't make the final decision, they're rarely held accountable and even when they are, their punishment is laughable. And that's why McKinsey & Co. are the consultants that deserve hell. But that's just what I think. Do you think McKinsey deserves hell? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you think McKinsey should be held accountable. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community, suggest future video ideas, and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.